last time uh, we were talking about, um, what were we talking about? Animal agriculture and uh, its relationship to uh, greenhouse gas production. And uh, I, I ended on this diagram right here, looking at uh, all the methane and nitrous oxide that uh, ruminants, cattle, and, and the like uh, are producing and how it's a real problem. Um, so uh, this chart sort of looks at um, the uh, the production emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, per kilogram of the protein source. All right. So uh, you can see for every kilogram of uh, lamb that is produced, you're getting almost 40 kilograms of uh, carbon dioxide emitted at the, or well, 35, about maybe 36 or so uh, kilograms of CO2 uh, emitted into the atmosphere uh, on, um, on the farm, on site. And then the little orange um, bracket on the top is, is the, the post-farm gate uh, emission. So that's processing, transport, retail, cooking, waste disposal, etc. So by, by far and away, the largest uh, portion of uh, the greenhouse gas contribution from any meat comes on the farm. All right, And it's these ruminants, uh, lamb, uh, cow, sheep, uh, who are sitting there farting. That's that with the methane emission, sir. How do we explain the difference between like beef and milk? Because they both like come from the same cow. Is that just like because of like density or? Yeah. Um, well, I guess the idea is that a dairy cow produces far more protein over its per lifetime. cow. Yeah, over its lifetime than a beef cow does, right? So it's just a, it's a more efficient way of, of producing animal protein in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's not talking about uh, nitrogen input because they still need all of that uh, feed to make that protein, right? And that's going to have that's going to have fertilizer inputs. This isn't considering that. Uh, this is considering instead of nitrogen, this is considering carbon. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if we look across, uh, but very good insight. Thank you for that question. Uh, if we look across these, um, these sources of protein, you know, to the left, we see that uh, animal protein has a much higher carbon footprint than vegetable protein. Um, and if we look at within that bracket of animals, uh, really, be, if, unless you want to live off a of canned tuna, um, chicken and eggs, chicken products, are really the, the <coughs> lightest uh, on the earth in terms of uh, protein sources for uh, their carbon footprint. I, by the way, I don't want you to be misled by this diagram by saying, wow, lamb is the biggest problem. We can't eat lamb. Uh, the this is not scale, this is per kilogram of protein source. And by far, cows are way more of a problem than, than lamb uh, because we produce way more uh, lamb or beef than, than lamb. Uh, but chickens are actually pretty, pretty uh, carbon uh, unintensive comparatively. So let's explore chickens in this quest for protein. Um, the this is getting at the paper that you guys uh, all should have submitted to, uh, for the second literature paper. Um, the broiler chicken as a signal for human reconfigured biosphere. Did anybody not find that paper? Anyone not find the paper? Good. Um, so some of the, who, what did you guys think of that paper? What were some of the interesting things? Who actually did more than like took two sentences out of the conclusion at, for the summary, the takeaway. Yeah. What did you think, Alex? Uh, it's interesting that 
compare the evidence that they're finding about the chickens like over time mm -hmm. and how like it's continually growing and then kind of match that up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were there were some pretty jaw dropping statistics in there um, in that paper. Uh, one the the first one that stuck out to me was you're right that chickens are growing uh, with time, both in uh, size and number, uh, to the point where chickens are now three times the biomass of all other birds on earth combined. If you took all birds on earth, three quarters of the mass of them, put them on a scale, three quarters, on a big scale, uh, three quarters of the mass of all of those birds would be chicken. That's freaky to me. That's really far out to me. Um, particularly since uh, these are domesticated birds that are so profoundly dependent upon human intervention for their own survival. If we magically disappeared, uh, so would the birds. They would be com so would these chickens. They'd be completely unable to survive without human intervention. Um, so there are about 22.7 billion chickens on Earth. That's a standing, at any one given time, that's a standing population. Uh, that's the largest single bird uh, standing population of a uh, bird species in Earth's history. So even the carrier pigeon, uh, which had something like 7 billion birds, uh, was, is probably the next closest uh, bird population, which is, has now since been extirpated, right? The, the uh, carrier pigeon's extinct uh, within the span of a, of a couple, a generation, generation and a half, two generations. Um, but the, the chicken far outnumbers that uh, by three times. So um, every year, uh, the humans consume, uh, currently, I guess it's about 70 billion uh, meat chicken carcasses are produced a year. Uh, that's, that's a lot, man. That's 10, that's about, just maybe about nine, I guess, birds per man, woman, and child on earth um, every year. It's a, it's a lot of, that's a lot of critters. Uh, and they say that it's probably a vat, that number, which is an official, you know, is a, is a, uh, compilation of official statistics that are reported by various countries and, and organizations. Uh, that's probably a vast underestimate, uh, given that the standing population is 22.7 billion, uh, and those chickens have an average lifespan of only about six weeks, right? So uh, from the time they're hatched to the time that they're culled uh, and uh, dressed, for consumption, it's only about six weeks, right? Um, and so if you think about at any given time, there's 22.7 billion, but those 22.7 billion on average are only living six weeks, uh, they're probably eating more than the 65, uh, 70 billion birds that are uh, officially reported totals, right? So there's the chicken apocalypse in some ways. A lot of birds, a lot of birds getting eaten here. Um, all right. And you can see that the number of chicken uh, being slaughtered is going uh, way, it's accelerating, whereas uh, cattle is decelerating, pigs are keeping uh, at a steady rate of acceleration. But chicken, the, the number of chickens being slaughtered is on an exponential increase. All right, so um, paper looked at some pretty interesting things. It looked at um, the size of the the broiler chicken uh, from the Middle Ages. Well, it actually looked even at more ancient, uh, the derivative, the red jungle fowl. Uh, the, the size increase si since... Uh, just the Middle Ages, we've had a doubling in, in the body size and a five-fold increase in body mass. Uh, so that means the, the body size is doubled, but the mass has uh, 
has, has gone up fivefold, that means there's been a significant amount of uh, conversion of pro fat to protein in that body. And we can see here that this has been particularly uh, prevalent in the 20th century, since the, basically since the war. Um, you can see the, the weight in pounds uh, has, number of millions of pounds has gone way up, uh, e even though the number of broilers, and the number of broilers has gone up, but it has not, uh, it's not, the number alone is not responsible for all that mass of chicken that's being produced. So that's revealed here in this picture on the right, where we see uh, a typical chick in 1957, 78, and 2005, uh, you know, all reasonably within the same um, order of magnitude of mass. They're all starting out between uh, 35 and 45 grams uh, at, at birth. And then um, the modern, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, bird from the 50s tops out just under uh, a kilogram after uh, about two months. And the... Um, modern bird, the contemporary bird, is over four kilograms at, in the same time period. Yeah, so this is not something that's easy to identify by any person, right? Because the time scale is such that there is this incremental change, this like shifting baseline that you may not notice within the span of your own lifetime very well, um, but um, if you were to show uh, one of these big birds today to what your great grandmother or grandmother was was cooking up, um, then they would be surprised at how large they are. Uh, so the, the article tried to track where uh, these these birds originated from. Um, and there were, uh, they, they, the ancestral range is in yellow here. Started, the modern chicken uh, is derived from the red jungle fowl that came out of uh, Indonesia in about uh, 6,000, I don't know, what was that, 8,000 years ago, uh, 6,000 BCE, uh, and then spread uh, westward into uh, the Middle East and, um, and Europe. So now... Most of uh, the countries on Earth have uh, industrial broiler uh, production using what's called a vertical integration system. Uh, we'll take a look at what that is and how that has uh, contributed to this uh, crazy growth in, in the birds, crazy growth uh, in, in the birds uh, that we consume. Here's just some uh, interesting data. So, you know, they're, they're saying that uh, because so many carcasses are being produced, you can find chicken bones in every landfill on Earth. Basically, it's consumed everywhere on Earth. Um, and it's industrial produ industrially produced in these uh, American innovated vertical integration systems where uh, the basic concept is that all of the steps in uh, production are essentially unified into a single uh, into a single facility and, and management company that's, that's dealing with it. Um, so if you, if you go into the archaeological record and look at uh, these bones that are being produced, the uh, red jungle fowl is depicted on the right and a contemporary broiler is on the left. You can see how radically uh, those birds have shifted over such a short period of time. And this is essentially happened, uh, this ha happened in the 20th century. So there was a gradual shift over time uh, the, in, the, in the green boxes in, these, in the whisker diagram here over the past 2,000 years. But it was really in the, in the 20th century when, boom, something happened. Something happened in the 20th century uh, to give us these, these big birds. Big birds. What is it? What do you think, Graham? What happened? The 20th century? Yeah. I would have thought it would have been 21st, but... Um, well, no, tw let's look it. I showed you this picture. It would have been this is 20th, 20th century right there. of big chickens? Where we lock them in cages all their lives and just feed them, feed them, feed them? Yeah. And it stacks up over in the genetic I don't know, branch, the genetic tree, genetic timeline. 
Yeah, we'll see in a moment here. So. Mm-hmm. Same should go for chicken. Well, <laughs> so certainly the chicken's diet has something to do with that uh, a little bit. Um, so this is looking at the uh, isotopic um, prevalence of carbon-13 and nitrogen-15, the two isotopes uh, of carbon and two isotopes of carbon and nitrogen, and uh, what you see here is, uh, so I, I talked about C3 and C4 plants, right? So uh, C3 um, plants are like um, things in the temperate climate, and C4 are more subtropical, like corn was a C4. And uh, they selectively incorporate uh, these isotopes at different rates. So when you look at the, uh, the bones from the fossil record, you can see that the bones uh, from the Roman and Anglo-Saxon period, high medieval, late medieval, uh, all of those uh, periods in time, those birds were essentially free range, out there eating bugs, eating, you know, whatever they could get down their gullets uh, in on the farm that they were being raised on. However, the modern broiler has a totally different uh, isotopic footprint in its bones, which uh, suggests that uh, they are a their diet has become pretty much exclusively uh, corn, maize, and since the 1950s. So there is, there is diet to blame up to a certain point, but it was this. Who, who watched the video? Did anybody watch that 20-minute video? Cool. Um, <clears throat> it was this contest that happened in the 40s, uh, striving to create... The chicken of tomorrow uh, win five thousand bucks, which is a huge amount of money. It's a huge amount of money. So five thousand bucks uh, in today's dollars back then, like five hundred thousand dollars. It's about five. It's about half a million bucks uh, to win this contest in, in, in like the buying power of that amount of money back then was, was roughly a hundred times uh, greater. Um, so they, they had this, the, uh, the, the government sponsored this competition for breeding the chicken of tomorrow. And they, they broke the country up into regions. They had regional competitions, the winners from those sent their uh, chickens in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can watch the 20-minute kind of uh, strange documentary from the, from the 40s uh, talking about it. But uh, the outcome of that was this massive, uh, uh, the outcome of this massive uh, countrywide uh, breeding program was um, these highly... Uh, genetically selected birds, genetically selected for um, their their size, and uh, a number of uh, a number of uh, metrics. You can watch the documentary. It talks about all the different way the criteria that they use to select the chicken of tomorrow. So once they've found the right bird. Um, <coughs> by polling essentially all the farms in America, because what farm back then wouldn't send 50 little eggs? All they had to do was send 50 fertilized eggs into this competition uh, to see whose birds did the best. And if you send 50 eggs in, you can win half a million bucks back in, in you know, in today's dollars. That's, that's a pretty... There's a pretty high participation rate, particularly considering it was in the, in the midst uh, coming out of the Depression, right? So that money would be radical back then. Um, so, so this countrywide selective breeding uh, program uh, competition uh, began to get paired with the advent of the change in the diet 
where uh, they switched the diet uh, to heavily to uh, corn and soybean meal. And then the third thing that happened was this sort of corporatization of the production facility and the, and the, and the, uh, the development of this vertical integration in the, in the poultry farm. So what happens here is uh, minimally the same company is going to have is going to uh, process the feed. They're going to have a feed mill where they're taking the corn. Sometimes they even own the fields that uh, are growing the corn, but they're milling it for sure. Uh, they're putting that into. Uh, they're making their own feed mixes. Uh, they're getting the chickens uh, from the breeding farm. They're hatching them at the hatchery, and they go into a grow house uh, where they grow them out, and then uh, they get shipped to a processing plant, all on the same site, all within the same farm. So all this is all happening on the same uh, farm. So the chickens get dressed out, and uh, they can have further processing, whatever that means. Uh, maybe it means... Uh, uh, cutting the chickens or preparing them in some other way for uh, di distribution uh, to a retail or grocery. So these, these places are going from corn to grocery all in one fell swoop, um, right? So cutting down on logistical costs, cutting out middlemen, uh, making it easy to have these enormous uh, chicken facilities. Has anybody been in a, in a chicken farm like this? Um, I mean, look at that thing. It's stretching literally to the horizon uh, of, of chickens. I have been in one in Georgia before, and it was, it was far out. It was incredible. Yeah, just like millions of birds. All right, so... Uh, and the, the final conclusion of this paper was simply uh, that, um, well, I'll quote it, the potential rate of carcass accumulation of chickens is unprecedented in the natural world. Uh, so they're saying that we're not only are we eating a lot of chickens, we're making a lot of carcasses, a lot of dead chicken bodies out there. And uh, these broiler chickens vividly symbolize the transformation of the biosphere to fit evolving human consumption patterns and show a clear potential to be a biostratigraphic marker species of the Anthropocene, uh, meaning that in 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, million years, who knows, uh, this is going to be uh, this sort of archaeological fingerprint of uh, right now. So broiler chickens, those bones will be uh, more or less resistant. Uh, to, they'll, they'll, you know, be able to survive in the landfills, and it is the sort of universality of, of chicken consumption uh, currently is uh, going to be one of the you know parts of the fingerprint that we're leaving on the <coughs> earth uh, for future generations of archaeologists, alien archaeologists. I don't know who's going to be looking at that stuff, but um, yeah, there's some interesting stuff out there. I found this blog called Streets of Brooklyn, and where this uh, woman goes out. She just, she takes photos of chicken bone trash that are on the street in bed -Stuy. Um She never sees anybody eating chicken, but she finds a lot of trash on the ground. Uh, so the, the point being that these chicken bones are everywhere, not just in landfills. They're, you, you can find, who hasn't seen uh, some chicken bones on the ground someplace before? Uh, I don't know. I, you haven't? No. Well, I, I'm from Detroit. I've definitely, yeah, I've definitely uh, seen chicken bones on the ground. But <clears throat> interesting stuff. Any questions about chicken before I move on? What do you think? What do you say? Thank you. Okay. Well, that's that's, that's good. Anything <laughs> else? Is that is it shocking to you? Is it um, no 70, 70 billion birds? That's about what you would have guessed. Yeah. Well, all right. So I just I just jammed a bunch of chickens on you there, um, 
And I'm going to ask you this question. What is the most consumed protein on earth? What do you guys think? We've talked about salmon. We've talked about beef a little bit, uh, or at least the, co the cost of production of beef uh, in terms of uh, nitrogen. We've talked about chickens. What's the most consumed protein on earth? Yeah. Okay, he says pork. Who agrees with pork? This is where I should. Pork. How many votes for pork? Please. It's only Zach. Nobody wants to get with him. Over there? What do you think? No? Okay, give me another one then. I will say. I will lean on chicken. All right. Uh, no, we'll call we'll call that something different. Anyone who else wants chicken? Anyone want to vote for chicken? This by like number of mass of, of protein consumed on Earth. Mass of protein consumed. So you're going you're going with chicken. Oh, you don't want chicken. So no, sorry, chicken, you're out of there. Okay, but are you still going with eggs? Who's going with eggs? Two for chicken. Oh, okay, two for chicken, zero for eggs. Anybody else? The most common sort. Yes, sir. Is it rice? Oh, oh, oh. rice uh, or soy? Pick one. You're going with rice. Okay, and so. By rice, what's the what's the protein in rice called? Okay. It's called gluten. It's called gluten. The, the protein that's in rice is gluten. So we got one for rice, and you're saying no to soy. I'll do two words. Okay. Another on rice. What about anybody else? What do you think? I have a question. Yes, sir. Ma'am. If you're, <laughs> you're gluten-free, you can eat. Huh? Uh, if if you are uh, trying to be gluten free, you are not eating rice that has gluten. So the answer is no. Yes. What is it? Uh, that's a good question. I think the answer is no. Anybody else? Nobody else wants to take a guess here? There's only five five people that have ventured. I'll go with pork. Pork? All right. So you what did you say? You said pork. You said pork. You said pork. What did you say? I'll say rice. Okay. What do you say? Oh. Okay. How about you, Mary? Rice. Rice is winning. Um, You're going with which? Rice. Rice? Oh, you said rice. Yeah, you, you want to say soy. Soy. All right. All right. You said eggs. He said eggs. Would you say? <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Well, uh, actually, the rice has it. Uh, it's not just rice. It's gluten in general. Gluten is by far, by far, far and away the uh, most consumed protein by mass on Earth. Um, so about uh, over 50% of protein uh, consumed is gluten. Uh, every, so uh, one out of every two grams or mass units of protein on Earth is going to be uh, some type of gluten. And that can be in rice, yes. Uh, it can be in wheat, a lot of wheat products out there. Um, so all those foods that you see in front of you uh, contain uh, some kind of, uh, the protein content is predominantly gluten. What the heck is gluten? What is it? In fact, let's see here, <laughs> before I show you what it is, what do you guys think it is? Does anyone have a, 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 it's interesting to me to, to know what the, because like, <coughs> who hasn't heard of gluten-free diet, right? 
I mean, mo- has anybody not heard of gluten before, the word? Who hasn't heard of the word? Everybody in the room has heard the word before, okay? But the truth is, how many of you know what it is, actually know what it is? It's a vegetable protein. Uh, but it, the thing that's interesting, it's not just one protein. Uh, it's a combination of proteins. So this is what gluten is. The word itself is simply Latin for glue. And the, the Romans lived off of bread. They lived off of bread. Olive oil and bread was like the staple meal for the masses. And in fact, uh, the first agricultural subsidy uh, in history was in the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire, the, the, the leaders, the aristocrats in Rome, they realized that to keep a stable empire, they need to have people fed and they didn't want people uh, not being able to afford food. So they subsidized, uh, the, with the taxes they collected, the Roman government subsidized the grain harvest, all right, so that uh, there were stable prices. Say some year there was a bad grain harvest. Well, they, they subsidized uh, that so that the price of grain didn't spike, right? And people could still afford to buy uh, bread. Um, gluten itself means glue uh, in Latin, and they recognize that it is the... Um, it is the glue, it's kind of like glue, it's the thing that keeps uh, dough sticking together. It makes the dough uh, kind of gooey. So it's made of uh, two proteins called uh, gliadin and glutenin, or glutenin, uh, gliadin and glutenin. And then you mix those with some water, they're already mixed actually, in a milled flour. You take the wheat berries and you mill them. And uh, then you add water and mix it, and you get gluten. So if we look in the cartoon on the right-hand side, in the top panel, we see dry wheat flour. Uh, And in dry wheat flour, we have these uh, stretches of gluten in. Uh, Some are high molecular weight. Some are low molecular weight. Uh, And there are these loops. They are linked uh, end-to-end with one another um, by these disulfide bonds that are from the methionine and the amino acids. You see the little gliadin protein uh, in there, not really interacting. But if you begin to um, hydrate the uh, uh, glutenin, then the uh, glutenin begins to uncoil a little bit and uh, self-associate, um, and uh, it begins to uh, form hydrogen bonds between the strands of the long fibrous uh, glutenin. So glutenin in itself is this uh, long fibrous coil, coiled protein, whereas uh, the gliadin is a globular protein. We talked, I talked in the lecture that I, that I posted when, the day I wasn't here, about the, the fibrous, the globular, and the transmembrane proteins, those categories. Well, glut, uh, glutenin is one of these long fibrous kind of coiled ones, and, and gliadin is a globular one. If you hydrate it and then add salt, um, the more salt you add to your dough, it's going to make that gluten um, hydrogen bond even more strongly to itself. It's going to uh, it's going to facilitate uh, the, that hydrogen bonding network and what's a, a, a type of uh, beta sheet formation in the uh, gluten and will make the dough harder. So uh, as you add salt, it's going to make the gluten stronger and tougher and the dough uh, sort of harder to, to eat and not as soft. So, right, there's a lot of kinds of bread have a lot of different types of consistency. There's like cake versus pizza dough versus a scone versus a, you know, uh, hard tack or something like that. Yes, sir. Is that uh, that why? No, no, we'll get to kneading in a moment. Yeah, we'll get to what kneading does in in a moment. 
So I want to get through this because uh, we're going to be doing some work with wheat on, on Friday. I want to start working with wheat a little bit. Uh, all right. So to answer your question, thank you for the setup. Um, on the left, this is some dough that has been hydrated. It's been hydrated, but not kneaded. So we've added water, we've hydrated the dough, and then they washed the dough. They took the dough and they washed it to remove the starch granules. Now, starch is a carbohydrate, and we're not going to get into starch until the next unit, which is coming up soon, next week, I guess. Uh, but uh, the starch has been removed from, from this slide. So you can see these fibers, all these fibers on the left, that's the gluten formation. So you have the, uh, the gluten in and the gliadin in there sort of at the junctions, right? But as you knead the dough, you sort of line these fibers up. And on the right-hand side is what the dough looks like after it's been kneaded a little bit. Again, the starch has been removed from this slide. So we're not, uh, we don't have to uh, be confused by the presence of the starch. But as you see, uh, the, all those fibers begin to line up and uh, form a sort of stronger, uh, st so a stronger network because they're all adding their strength and their elasticity in the same direction. So when you, who's made dough before? Anybody worked with a dough? Yeah, okay, most of you, good, that's great. So when you're working that dough and if you were to pick it up and pull it, it kind of stretches back a little bit, doesn't it, right? That would be these, these lines of uh, that gluten, you're stretching along those lines and then they're coming back uh, to their original, to their original shape. And the more salt is in it, uh, so presumably when you're making dough, uh, you've take, there's the dry mix first, right? You have your flour and you put your baking powder, if you want to put that in there to like adjust the pH. Uh, you can put your salt in there, and you mix all that stuff up together. Like you can sift it or whatever you're doing to your dough. Then you add the water. So the salt presumably is already dispersed throughout the mix, right? The kneading is uh, facilitating gluten formation and gluten alignment in, in the dough. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is uh, kind of the same thing, but uh, the, the starch has not... Uh, been washed out of the matrix. They've washed it off the surface so you can see some of the gluten that's uh, forming, uh, that's being revealed, but you see all those like the pebbly stuff that's in there? That's the starch. Those are carbohydrate uh, like aggregates uh, that we call starch that are uh, inside the bread. When you bake bread, that like super yummy smell, and we'll talk about it. We're going to do uh, some stuff with the Maillard reaction, the Amadori rearrangement, the Maillard reaction. That's a reaction between the protein, which are the fibers you see there, and the carbohydrate, which are the starch molecules you see there. All right? That <coughs> tasty, yummy smell is a chemical reaction that happens between the amino acids and the carbohydrates, called the Maillard reaction. Um, but as you knead dough... Uh, you know, this, the dough on the, on the left is, is under kneaded, and the one on the right has been optimally kneaded so that you have the, the gluten is now not just strands, but they begin to form these comprehensive sheets, these sheets that trap the, um, that trap the starch inside these sort of like bubbles, these layers of, uh, of gluten protein. All right. So this is just a zoom in of that. Um, and what happens here, we have on, on the left is a zoom in of optimally kneaded dough. You have these sheets of gluten, the starch trapped in there. Uh, and that starch is uh, getting hydrated, right? Carbohydrates like, we'll talk about this, but they like to, to draw up water as you bake the, the bread, um, these layers sort of uh, form these compartments uh, in the bread. We call this the crumb. Uh, it, the, it, gas is evolved uh, from the breakdown of the starches uh, by the yeast, 
and these sheets of uh, gluten begin to form uh, bubbles in, in the bread. And that's what you see under a microscope. You can see the sheets uh, before it's really been uh, blown up. All right. Any, any questions so far? Well, what affects this, the development of the strength of gluten, right? Because, I, you know, I said you can have a cupcake. A cupcake tastes pretty different than a piece of pizza, but they're both made of flour, right? Um, it's the, the most important thing that's going to affect the development of the strength of gluten is the variety of wheat. And so I, I need to go to the store tomorrow. I'm going to try to pick up some soft wheat berries uh, and I'll, I'll soak some hard ones, I'll soak some soft ones, and you guys can taste test the difference between a soft and a hard wheat berry. Um, bread, pizza, uh, you know, like crusty bread or pizza, stuff like that, is tends to be made out of um, hard red wheat berries. So hard wheat contains more protein, about 15% uh, uh, protein per mass, uh, more gluten in, larger, uh, larger strands of gluten in, the higher molecular weight gluten ins, uh, the uh, gluten uh, network, because they're larger, if it's going to form a stronger, more cohesive and elastic gluten, uh, whereas uh, pastry flour is um, a type of soft wheat that uh, has less protein and uh, less gluten in. Gluten in that's there is, uh, has a lower molecular weight, uh, and the gluten that is formed is not as powerful. And then uh, cake flour is on the other end uh, of the spectrum. You can actually go to the store and, and buy what's called vital wheat gluten and add it to your flour. If the flour that you have you feel like doesn't have enough gluten in it and you want more stretchiness and more like bread-like characteristic to your your dough you can add uh, a little bit of gluten to your mix I mean, we might even experiment with that I, I have a bunch of gluten uh, has anyone had seitan before you had a question i was wondering where all-purpose flour mm -hmm. yeah so an, an all-purpose flour is going to be a flour that has a medium hardness so all-purpose flour would be yeah right around here Something like this. Can you use it to make bread? You can use it to make bread. Yeah. The ideal bread is going to be made out of a bread flour, but all-purpose flour has an intermediate uh, level of, of gluten content. It has a, a wide mix of molecular weights of uh, gluten in, in it, and it can be used for a variety of purposes. Good question. What did I ask before that? I was asking some question. What did I say? Oh, yeah. Has anyone had seitan before? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> uh, seitan is like, a, it's like a meat substitute that comes from Asia. It's basically pure gluten. It's made purely of gluten. Um, pretty good stuff, maybe. I guess we could make that in class. Would that be fun? I don't know. It tastes good? I think it tastes delicious, but I... I'm a good like cook. A weird texture, right? It has a little bit of a weird texture. Yeah, I mean, not. It's. It's weird. It's, it's like meatish, right? It's not. It's it's like firmer and chewier than um, than tofu and that kind of stuff, right? But yeah, okay, we'll pick up uh, there on Friday and then lab, do some cooking. Um, I wanted to make sure you.